Happy New Year to you, church family. It's so good once again to gather together with you. Um, as we've said so many times in the past, we long to be together on a Sunday morning, but we're thankful for these, uh, these electronic, digital, virtual methods to gather together, and I'm so thankful that you chose to take part in this, this virtual gathering here this morning. Please know that as we uh, take it in together, as we participate together on a Sunday morning, I believe that God binds our hearts together uh, as one in the body of Christ. So, so draw encouragement from that and strength from that here this morning. As we begin a new year, and uh, considering the challenges, but also the opportunities that lay before us as a church, Paul's letter to the, the Thessalonian church, his first letter to them, stood out to me as being incredibly important for us to spend some time in in the coming weeks. There's just a, just a few reasons why I've chosen, why I've prayerfully chosen uh, first, first Thessalonians here in these coming weeks. First reason, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul wants to encourage the church in Thessalonica that was going through a time of hardship and persecution. Now, you might not agree with me, and, but I would say that we as a church are going through uh, a small, small bit of persecution these days as we've been uh, kind of these restrictions that we've been going through. The church in ancient Thessalonica was persecuted as well. And during the coming weeks, we will learn from them and from Paul, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this letter, how to be faithful to God in a world that wants us as the church to put our faith in anyone or anything but God. So let's, let's keep that in mind here as we work our way through this, this amazing letter called 1 Thessalonians. Second reason, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul wants to encourage the church to live holy lives in an unholy sort of world. Now, I know that this isn't new news to you, but we live in a broken, sinful world. We see abuse and scandals and fraud and deception and racism and greed and pride and hatred, all those sorts of things in our world. And uh, th there's, there's just so many things that we can see going on that just are sourced in evil. You name it, it's likely happening and a lot these days. And the same was happening in the Mediterranean world in Paul's day. Thessalonica was a large city. It was a city with lots of money. It was an opulent sort of city. It was a multicultural sort of city as well. And it was also a port city. If you remember way back when we looked at the, the Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians, uh, we, we looked at how Corinth was a very, it was like Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and New York all rolled into one. It was like the, it was like sin city to the max. And I would pose to you that Thessalonica probably wasn't quite like Corinth in Paul's day, but it had elements of it. And it was, there was definitely, it was an unholy sort of city with everything going on in it. And Paul, in this, in this letter, encourages the church to live a holy life, a life that is pleasing to God in unholy sort of circumstances, in an unholy sort of environment. So please, let's pay attention to that as we work our way through this letter as well. Third reason why I've prayerfully chosen 1 Thessalonians is that Paul in 1 Thessalonians talks much about the return of Jesus. Now, many of you that I've spoken with in the past number of months, you have been longing for Christ to return and establish his kingdom here on this earth. And I share that longing with you. I had that longing when I was a young child, and that longing has only intensified in the past number of years and months as well. And in this letter, Paul talks about the second coming of Christ, how Christ will come and right the wrongs in the world and establish his perfect kingdom on this planet. So I, I, I expect that we will, they will just increase the anticipation that we have for Jesus' return as we read Paul's amazing words about that coming that we are just longing for, that Jesus promises will be soon. So those are the reasons why I've chosen 1 Thessalonians here for us to dig into in the coming weeks, the next couple, three months until, until our Easter season comes up. And uh, just, just recognize that in this world that, that is very much upside down, Jesus will come and turn this world right side up. And that's the title for my sermon here as we uh, dig into God's Word here this morning. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
1 Thessalonians 1. 1 Thessalonians is a bit tough to find. You uh, hit the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you have Acts, Romans, pretty big books, and then you have 1 and 2 Corinthians, which are larger books as well. Then you get into some smaller books, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then you hit 1 Thessalonians, and that's where we're going to focus in on today. If you've hit Hebrews, you've gone a little bit too far, just back up about 10 pages in your Bible, and you'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We're just going to dig into three verses as well as the story in the book of Acts here today. Please allow me to read this passage for you. 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ Grace and peace to you. Verse 2 We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers, writes Paul. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 3. I thought it would be helpful for us to pray the Lord's Prayer together. We haven't done this for quite a number of weeks. Got it on the screen behind me here. Please allow me to lead you through this amazing prayer that, uh, that Jesus gave for us in, in the book of Matthew. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So, Paul starts out. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Now, from what we gather, Paul was the primary author of this book or this letter. Remember, this is a letter written to the church in Thessalonica. He wrote this letter under the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which makes these, his words God's words, which makes his words truth, which makes his words have authority over our lives as well. And Tim, Silas and Timothy assisted him in the writing of this, and Paul here gives them credit, though I would say that Paul is the primary author of this book. And he writes to the church of the Thessalonians. So likely this letter was written around 50 to 51 AD. About five years earlier, Paul and Barnabas, another disciple, embarked on their first church planting tour that we often call Paul's first missionary journey. And they went on this journey, you can see they went to the island of Cyprus and also here into central, uh, what we know as Turkey now, which is the area called Galatia and Pamphylia in Paul's day. This is why their first missionary journey. And everywhere there's a dot, that's where they planted a church. Paul and Barnabas went out to tell people about the gospel, but also to plant churches, to plant local congregations in all these communities. Now, about five years after this, Paul believed that God wanted him to revisit the churches in central Turkey, to encourage them and to teach them. So he went on what we call Paul's second missionary journey with another disciple and church planter named Silas, also known as Silvanus. Same name, just a different language. And on this tour, while they were in Lystra, here's Lystra right here, while they were in Lystra, they encountered a young Christian man named Timothy. And Paul obviously saw something special in Timothy when he encountered him. He saw a likely giftedness and also a calling on Timothy's life. And he and Silas brought, brought Timothy along on this, on this second missionary journey. Picking the story up in Acts 16, verse 6, it says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. So that's, there's Phrygia there, there's Galatia right there having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word here in the province of Asia. So you can see as they're traveling along how Jesus Christ opens doors and closes doors. The Holy Spirit opens doors and closes doors for them to guide them along the journey as they end up where they're going to be in Thessalonica before long. When they came to the border of Mysia, which is right here, they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, which is here to the north. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to do so. Verse 8, so they passed by Mysia, and they went down to Troas, which is fairly close to the coast, 
coast of modern day Turkey. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia, which is here in northern Greece. And, uh, and, and this man of Macedonia was standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia, he said, and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. And from there we traveled to Philippi. You can see Philippi on the map right there. A Roman colony and leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there, writes Luke, for several days. Now in Philippi, if you recall the story, they had some success in planting a church there. Quite a number of people said yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a church that was started there. There was also hardship as well. And it's because of that hardship that Paul and Silas and Timothy were forced to leave Philippi. Um, and then they headed west towards Thessalonica. Acts 17, verse 1. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. Now, in Paul's early church planting days, he often went first to the local Jewish synagogue, if there was one in that city. In Thessalonica, Thessalonica at that time, there were quite a few Jewish people, from what we gather, because there was enough Jewish people to have a synagogue. Now, to my knowledge, they haven't found the ruins of this ancient synagogue that Paul visited, but there are ancient ruins in the center of the modern city of Thessalonica, which is now called Thessaloniki, and you can see a picture of it here. There's the modern ruins in the center of the city. They call it the Forum in Thessalonica. You can see all the different ruins right there. Over there in the distance, there's a theater or an odeon, they call it. You can see it's right here in the middle of the city. Amazing sight to go to, I'm sure, if you're ever there. Verse 2. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, from the Bible, explaining and proving that the Christ, that the Messiah, that Jesus had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus that I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, is the Messiah, Paul said. Verse 4, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and not a few prominent women. So Paul spoke in the synagogue for three Sabbath days. We don't know if these were three consecutive Sabbath days or just three Sabbath days. Either way, though, whether they were consecutive or not, we get the impression that Paul was not in Thessalonica really for that long. And he persuaded the Jewish people there who, who clung to Judaism, which is the, the Old Testament minus Jesus kind of aspect of the faith. They clung to Judaism and he convinced them that Jesus Christ came and he in fact was their Messiah. He also convinced some, some Greeks who had, who had embraced Judaism that Jesus Christ was their Messiah as well. And not a few prominent women, so there's a fair number of prominent women in the city that Paul convinced that Jesus Christ was their Messiah, their King too, and they said yes to Jesus. Now, I don't believe we should cruise by this, this moment too quickly. We need to consider what happened to these people when they said yes to Jesus. Remember, Paul, Silas, and Timothy came to Thessalonica and told people the good news. They told them the gospel. I've shown you this gospel acrostic before, and I think it's a great way of explaining what the gospel is all about. The G stands for this, God created us to know him, to be with him. So remember, at the very beginning, Adam and Eve walked with God until sin came into the world which is here, here, our sins separate us from God, but, but realize that we are meant to be with God and to walk very closely with Him. But our sins separate us from Him. Remember, God is holy, and as sinful people, we cannot be with God, so something needs to take care of our sins. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds is the, three, the third point, the S part of this acrostic. So we try to do lots of good things in life. We do, we do good things for people. We pray, we, we go to church, we worship, we do all these amazing things. But you know something? Those amazing things don't get rid of our sins. They might be good things that we're doing, but it's not enough to get rid of our sins. P stands for paying the price for sin. Jesus Christ died and rose again. 
Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. He was the one who lived a sinless life. He was the one who died on the cross. And his death means something for the, all of humanity if we choose to accept what he accomplished for us on that cross. And Jesus Christ paid the price for that sin. E, everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. We don't trust in our good deeds. We don't trust in our education. We don't trust in our good breeding. We don't trust in our nationality. We don't trust in our past. We just trust in Jesus. That's who we trust in to, to, to forgive, to take away our sins. And L stands for life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, how Jesus Christ came to give us a life to the full, a more and better than we can possibly dream sort of life. And that's what Jesus Christ promises to give us today if we say yes to him and forever with him as well uh, in his kingdom. John 5 verse 24 says this, I love this verse, Jesus, these are G the words of Jesus in the book of John. I tell you the truth, says Jesus, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, meaning the Father, has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed from death to life. Many of you have seen the illustration before how there's a chasm separating us from God and we can't do anything to get across that chasm. All those good things that we do, it can't possibly get us across. The gap is too large. But Jesus Christ came and his cross built a bridge for us to cross over from, life, from death to life. And that's what happens when we put our trust in Jesus and surrender our lives to him. And that is what happened to the Thessalonians in this moment. Their lives didn't merely get a little bit better. They were born again. They were made new people. They were, they were filled with the life of the living Christ in this moment. They were once enemies of God and they were now his friends and they crossed over from death to life. A miraculous thing happened in that moment. And as so often um, when good things are happening, the enemy comes in and starts to cause trouble. I've seen it so often in my life, and we can see it here in this story as well. Verse 5, Acts chapter 17 says this, But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. That, that's, that picture we just saw, that would be the marketplace there. And they formed a mob, and they started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house. Now, Jason was one of those converts to Christianity in search of Paul and Silas in order, in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers, some other Christians, before the city officials, shouting, These men have caused trouble all over the world and have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are defying Caesar's creed, decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. Are they right? Are these accusers correct? Well, actually they are. They are correct. Paul is defying at least one of Caesar's decrees in this moment. We know for sure that Paul would take issue with, with one decree, that people needed to bow the knee to Caesar that they needed to worship him, that they needed to honor him as a god, as the supreme god of their empire and of the world. You see, the biggest problem with Christianity back in the first century AD, the, the problem that people had with Christianity, wasn't that people worshipped God or Yahweh, the one and only true God. It was that they worshipped only Yahweh. They worshipped only God. The Thessalonians, like people all around the Mediterranean world in those days, they worshipped many gods, gods like Dionysius, or Serapis, or Isis, or Aphrodite, or Demeter, or Zeus, or Asclepius, or Cabiris, these many, many gods that they worshipped. But as a part of the Roman Empire, they also needed to worship, first and foremost, the emperor. And when you bowed the knee to Jesus, you could respect and follow the emperor, but you would never bow the knee to him as you would to the one and only true God. You would never burn incense to the emperor like you would burn in, burning incense to the one and only true God. And when many in Thessalonica 
said yes to King Jesus. It caused trouble all over the city, just like it has caused trouble all around the world, as these accusers, the Jews, are saying in this moment. I appreciate how many translations render Acts 17 verse 6. In the English Standard Version it says, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. I love that rendering of this verse. They've turned the world upside down, they say. It's amazing, don't you think, how the world perceives the church. The world thinks that it's right side up and that we as the church are upside down. But according to the Bible, the world could not be more wrong. According to the Bible, the world is in fact upside down and the church is right side up. And here's the thing, everyone. We were made to be right side up. If we are upside down for too long, we will become disoriented and lose our senses and eventually we will succumb and die. Growing up on the farm, many, many years we would get these little chicks, about this big, little fluffy yellow chicks, and these chicks would eat a lot, and they would grow quite quickly, and they would become these great big 10-pound meat birds, big white birds. And in the fall, we would butcher them, but when we did so, we would first hang the chickens upside down, I don't know if too many uh, farmers would do this, but that's how we would go about it. When the chickens are right side up, they're, they're kind of more violent or active, a little bit tougher to control. But when we would hang them upside down, they would actually, it wouldn't take long before they became quite disoriented as the blood rushed into their heads. And, um, and eventually, obviously, we, when we separated their head from their body, it was not a violent process really at all. The process that it went through. Church, I would pose to you that right now the world is trying to convince us that they are right side up and that we as the church are upside down. But nothing could be further from the truth. And sadly, unless we allow Jesus to make things right in our lives and turn us right side up, we will be lost. We will be without hope and we will be eternally separated from God. Romans 10 verses 4 through 10 in the message uh, puts it this way. I love how the message puts this particular passage. By the way, the message is a paraphrase. It's not a translation. So paraphrases are more about thought for thought versus word for word. And I, as I've told you many times before, you should never just use a paraphrase. You should always have a translation beside that paraphrase. But I love how the Romans 10 passage is, is uh, expressed in the message. Listen to this. It says, The earlier revelation, meaning the law, was intended simply to get us ready for the Messiah, to get us ready for Jesus, who then puts everything right for those who trust him to do it. Moses wrote that anyone who insists on using the law code to live right before God soon discovers it's not so easy, every detail of life regulated by the fine print. But trusting God to shape the right living in us is a different story. No precarious climb up to heaven to recruit the Messiah, no dangerous descent into hell to rescue the Messiah. So what exactly was Moses saying, writes Paul? The word that saves is right here, as near as the tongue in your mouth, as close as the heart in your chest. He says it's the word of faith that welcomes God to go to work and to set things right for us. This is the core of our preaching, writes Paul. Say the welcoming word to God that Jesus is my master. Embracing body and soul, God's work of doing in us, what he did in raising Jesus from the dead. That's it. You're not doing anything, he says. You're simply calling out to God, trusting him to do it for you. That, he says, is salvation. With your whole being, you embrace God setting things right. And then you say it right out loud. God has set everything right between him and me. Isn't that incredible? That God has forgiven me and begun to order my life as it was meant to be. That God has made me a, a former, formerly an enemy of him, now his friend. 
that God has turned me formerly upside down, now right side up. And that's what God was doing in Thessalonica as well. And that upside down people of the city, they didn't like it very much. Verse 8, Acts 17. When they heard this, when they heard that Paul said that Jesus was the true king, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. And then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was, was, as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. So Jason, who is now a follower of Jesus, he bails out Paul and his friends. And part of this bailing out agreement, it would seem, is that Paul and Silas will not come back to Thessalonica. They made a deal, if you will. A city that, be, that because of them has begun to be turned right side up or upside down. They think upside down, but right side up, in fact. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy then go on to Berea, and they plant a church there. You can see Berea right here. And then, uh, and then when the Thessalonians caught wind of this, they sent a delegation to Berea, and they caused trouble for Paul again, and Paul was forced to leave, and then he went to Athens, telling people the good news of Jesus there as well. And then Paul went on to Corinth, down here in the bottom part of, of Greece, and spent 18 months there planting a church in that crazy city of Corinth that we've talked about in the past. Now, while Paul was in Corinth, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to see how the young church was doing. Timothy went there for a time and then came back to Paul in Corinth and reported to him how the church, how the young church in Thessalonica was doing. And this is Paul's response, 1 Thessalonians, to how the Thessalonians are doing after he heard Timothy's report. One latter part of verse 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, here we go. To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. To the church. Now the Greek word for church is the word ekklesia. We talk about that word once in a while. It means gathering. It means assembly. There were other assemblies or gatherings in those days, but this is the assembly that gathered, as it says, in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's assembly. So in the first century, other ecclesias would gather to do the business of the emperor, the king at that time. But this ex ecclesia would gather to do the business of the king of kings and the lord of lords. We, the church, are about the business of King Jesus. That is our business. By the way, in case you're watching the news these days and wondering why churches are so worked up about not being able to gather these days, this is why churches get so worked up. We are not just a group of people that have a similar beliefs. We are an assembly. And what do assemblies do? We assemble. We gather together. And when we can't assemble, we start to get unsettled and worked up. That's why churches are starting to do what they're doing these days, in case you were wondering. Verse 2, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. Paul, he had an incredible fondness, I believe, for the Thessalonian church, much more than some other churches that he was with. Verse 3, we continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Several times in scripture, we will see these three words, faith, love, and hope in the same sentence. I, can, I know you can think of a few examples even right now, some of you. First of all, he talks about their work produced by faith. Scripture is quite clear that our faith should result in work or in doing good deeds, doing things that Jesus would want us to do. If there are not good deeds in our life, then likely there is no faith within us. The Thessalonian church was a church that put its faith, its trust in Jesus alone for their salvation. And that faith was active in doing good things, doing good deeds for one another and also for the community. Similarly, the second part, their labor was prompted by love. They didn't do good things. Their, their faith wasn't active to try and prove something or to show off to those around them. 
They simply but passionately served one another out of love. This sacrificial, unconditional love, this agape love that we talk about so often. It was a love for God and a love for their community. And that was their motive in everything that they did. And thirdly, this was a church that had an endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus gives his church hope, does he not? He gives us hope. Hope because he is alive today. He is sitting on the throne of the universe. Hope because he will return someday as well, as I talked about at the beginning of this sermon. He will gather up and protect his people in that moment and establish his perfect kingdom here on this planet. He gives us hope because we know that he will turn this upside down world right side up once again, as it is meant to be. He gives us hope because no matter what happens to our bodies, whether we are to die in our sleep tonight or whether our lives are to be taken uh, because of persecution in the future, we know, we know, we know that there is hope there, that our souls will always be firmly in his grip. He will never let us go as his people. And this hope, writes Paul, it gives us endurance. Walking with Jesus has been called a long obedience in the same direction, in God's direction. We endure, we continue, we persevere. We don't lose heart because of the hope that Jesus Christ has given us. Question for you, do you have this hope today? Do you have the hope of Jesus within you today? Have you trusted Jesus for your salvation to remove your sin? And are you laboring out of faith and love these days? In August of 1793, a plague of yellow fever impacted the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, down in the States. It was a city at that time of 55,000 people. And at the time, it was also the capital of the United States, as Washington, D.C. was just being built at the time. At first, just a few people were dying of yellow fever every day. And then a few turned into a few dozen every day. And then a few dozen turned into hundreds every day were dying of this yellow fever. The poor had nowhere to go in this moment, but the rich left town to avoid the yellow fever. Doctors, with their limited knowledge, did what they could to save people and keep them from getting sick. But at the time, it wasn't realized that yellow fever was transmitted through the bite of a mosquito. Philadelphia was full of people, but it was a ghost town on the streets. The streets were absolutely deserted. The shops were closed. That The blinds were pulled in every person's home. The shutters were closed as well. Um, just shutting in the windows. And as the fall and the frosts came, though, the mosquitoes died. And the number of sick and dying began to decrease. Though amazingly, in this moment, hardly anyone recognized this reality that the mosquitoes were gone and that people were no longer dying of the yellow fever. No one except for one person recognized it in this moment. And it was on November the 11th of 1793 the streets of Philadelphia were deserted as everyone stayed in their homes, shriveling up due to fear and a lack of hope in that moment. And then a solitary figure appeared at the end of the street. He was an older man, quite dignified, and he was riding a white horse. Slowly, he and his horse walked up the, the center of that, those barren streets. And as he did, one by one, the people of Philadelphia opened their doors opened their shutters, came outside, and they began to resume life as they were meant to do. This man who did this was none other than George Washington, the President of the United States. In that moment, he brought incredible hope and life for his people. As we begin this new year, our circumstances, there's some similarities there, don't you think? Yet the difference is that our leader, our king, has already brought hope for us some 2,000 years ago. And he will return and he will bring hope again and completely set things right in this upside-down world that we live in. 
And as we wait, as we endure, as the scriptures say, we too are called to be a people who bring hope and love and faith to our world, a world without hope. A world that thinks it's right side up, but in fact, it's upside down. A world that needs to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can set things right in this chaotic world that we live in. Once again, question, do you have this hope? Do you need a fresh dose of hope, perhaps, today? Only Jesus can provide it for you. He is the true King of the world. If you have this hope, then I want you to consider something else. What is calling God calling you to do as one of his representatives to try to do your part to bring hope to this world? Just think about people around you who need to be loved, people who need to be told the gospel. That is something for all of us as a church to consider on this day when this world needs hope so desperately. Please allow me to lead you in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we begin this year, the year 2021, no doubt we are contemplating the year that's been, which has been a tough kind of year for many of us. And Lord, we don't know what this coming year holds, but we do know who holds it very carefully in his hand. 2021 is known by you, it is orchestrated by you. And I believe, Father, that you are Lord of this year, just as you were Lord of 2020 as well. Thank you, Jesus, that you came some 2,000 years ago and you walked down those barren streets and you brought hope to this world. You continue to do so today. And we pray in the name of Jesus that you would return and establish your kingdom here, your perfect kingdom on this imperfect world. In the meantime, Lord, as we wait for you to return, I pray that we as your church, Lord, would be active in, in expressing and in telling people your gospel, your good news, in, in um, communicating the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world around us. Give us a deep, deep love, Lord, for you, for one another, and also for our community as well. For those, Lord, that do not have this hope, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would open up their hearts, Lord, to your truth. Jesus is just a prayer away, a heartfelt, sincere prayer away. Just say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I choose, Lord, to follow you. I choose to make you my Lord and my Savior and I worship you, my King. I pray, Lord, for anyone that has prayed this prayer for the first time, that you would fill them full of your spirit, that you would fill them full of hope, that you would assure them in the interior of their soul, Lord, that they would know that you are there and that you are for them as your child. I pray in the name of Jesus that if any of your people, Lord, need a fresh dose of hope in this moment, Lord, that they would draw courage from you today, drawing so close to you and your word these days, and that you would fill us full of the hope, Lord, that can only come through you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are coming to turn this upside down world right side up and to set things right. Once again, we pray that that would be soon. In Jesus' incredible name, we pray these things now. Amen.